The Guggenheim was a mistake from the beginning. Solomon Guggenheim was a dead man six years before construction even began, and Frank Lloyd Wright would be dead six months before the doors opened. The Baroness Hilary Bay, who had orchestrated the whole thing, was out of the picture too by the museum's debut. In fact she never set foot in the Temple of Spirit she had commissioned Frank Lloyd Wright to build. The other Guggenheims turned against her, and kicked her off the board after the old man croaked. While the museum opened the Baroness brooded at her Connecticut estate. The building was designed to house the rapidly expanding Museum of Non-Objective Painting which had been located in a former car dealership on Park Avenue. But first things first. A Museum of Non-Objective Painting? Has an idea ever seemed so completely defunct? The Museum of Non-Objective Painting was the fruit of a long collaboration between Hilary Bay and Solomon Guggenheim. Baroness Rebay was a non-objective painter of questionable talents who introduced her patron to the non-objective paintings of the European avant-garde and Wassily Kandinsky in particular. Essentially the Baroness became Solomon's art advisor, and soon he was converted to the Church of Non-Objective Painting. Dot of the original 46 paintings maybe a dozen are good. One must ask, is it really justified to start a museum with a dozen good paintings? Evidently yes, according to the Baroness, and before long the collection doubled and tripled until the car dealership couldn't contain it all, and it became clear that something drastic had to happen. It was decided that a museum would be built from the ground up. An historic structure. A temple to convert the unconverted. Dot but where was all of this money coming from? Like all real money it came from the earth. It's a fine line between modern mining and modern art. In fact there's hardly a separation at all. These two elements, on the one hand of the industrial defilement of the earth, and on the other of the play of pure abstract forms on a canvas, exist like two strands of a virus in the name Guggenheim. The Guggenheim fortune was built on the American Smelting and Refining Company, once the largest refiner of non-ferrous metals, Bannon. At the time of Museum of Non-Objective Painting, Asako was running the world's largest lead refinery in downtown Omaha. The scale of contamination and death this refinery would so, can hardly be imagined. Suffice it to say that even today, Asako is the owner of 20 Superfund sites across the country, and is also currently in Chapter 11 Bankruptcy. Asako's history is a long and sordid affair. It's hardly worth getting into save to mention that in 1916 18 of their employees were killed and mutilated by Pan Chovy's men in Kiowa. Ten years later, as Solomon fell under the Baroness's influence and started to collect non-objective art, Pan Chovy's skull was stolen from his grave. It's probably worth saying a few things about Frank Lloyd Wright. In the early part of the 20th century Frank Lloyd Wright moonlighted as one of the most prominent Japanese art dealers in North America. After organizing the world's first Hiroshige exhibition at the Chicago Institute of Art in 1905, Frank Lloyd Wright started to sell Yukio Ewood block prints on a large scale, including a collection of hundreds of prints to the Met. By the 1920s a retouching scandal dogged Frank Lloyd Wright. From there on out his art dealings would only diminish. Eventually, in the face of serious debt, he would sell thousands of prints for a song. Was it not enough for his lover and loved ones to have been ex-murdered at Tuliasen? And for this beloved home to have burnt down not once but twice? What did fate not have in store for this man, the Guggenheim would be his ultimate glory. The conquest of architecture. It is perhaps the only museum in which it is practically impossible to show paintings. Frank Lloyd Wright was right when he said it would make the Met look like a Protestant barn, but is it any place to show paintings? Many of the top painters of the day responded with a definitive. No. For one the walls of the interior, like the building itself are curved. This is a big problem for the presentation of paintings. In truth the space was not designed to show paintings at all. Frank Lloyd Wright's hackneyed idea to show the paintings angled upward and resting on ledges 
as on an artist Cecil was quickly dismissed by James Sweeney, who had become the museum's director. It was one of many points of contention between Frank Lloyd Wright and Sweeney. They soon found themselves locked in a not power struggle over the fate of the museum become temple. The display of paintings hardly seemed to matter to Frank Lloyd Wright who was as concerned with insisting on an off-white for the interior, and which Sweeney opposed, as he was with the collection itself. Eventually it was decided that the paintings would hang from rods descending from the ceiling, sensible enough, except for that the building still does not accommodate looking at paintings. Everything about it is wrong. In 1956, before the museum opened, and while Frank Lloyd Wright was still alive, 21 of the most prominent painters in New York came forth with an open letter in protest. The artists tried to put it as bluntly as possible. Quote the interior design of the building, is not suitable for a sympathetic display of painting and sculpture. The basic concept of a curvilinear slope for presentation of painting and sculpture indicates a cause disregard for the fundamental rectilinear frame of reference necessary for the adequate visual contemplation of works of art. We strongly urge the trustees of the Guggenheim Museum to reconsider the plans for the new building. Willem de Kooning, Philip Gustin, Robert Motherwell, Adolf Gottlieb, Franz Klein, Milton Avery and 15 other names signed this letter. Jackson Pollock, had he not died the same year, probably would have signed it too. This subjugation of painting to a loopy architecture was a slap in the face to be sure. As for what Kandinsky and his circle thought about the building's design we can only speculate. Do their paintings were as rectilinear as everyone else's? It's easy to imagine that they at least had their doubts. Not to mention that Frank Lloyd Wright hated New York City, hated its architecture, and made no secret about it. So why was such a finicky and combative architect as Frank Lloyd Wright summoned, in his twilight years, no less, to create the radical modernist monument that Robert Moses justly described as an inverted oatmeal dish? The architect, at the least, was fully convinced and his exuberance grew to borderline delusional as he began to make wild predictions that the building could even survive an atomic bomb, that it would just bounce up and down in the blast, like a mighty spring. A mighty spring indeed. Dot is for Solomon Guggenheim. Who is he but a cipher? The impeccably dressed old man with the oversized ears and prunish lips. The retired industrialist. Mr. Moneybags bankrolling the whole thing, to show the baroness, how with it he was. And then the dead man, long before construction began, and the mountains of money he left behind to see the vision through to the end. How could he have known, that the trustees would turn against the baroness, almost as soon as he perished? How could he not have known? The baroness had always been a pain in everyone's ass. Everyone except Solomon. But was he as convicted as the high-flying architect the Baroness had hired? How could he not have foreseen her rejection? In Solomon's absence the Baroness became obsolete. The board had been dying to get rid of her. It wasn't long before she was sent packing for Connecticut, and not even to be invited to the opening. Solomon must have seen it coming. At least a part of him must have known. But let's go back to the original collection. Let us look at the paintings themselves. Please look at Kandinsky's small pleasures, and tell me it is not one of the ugliest things you have ever seen. And composition it. It's probably his worst painting. A bow-housey soup of shapes and colors. So what? With the shapes only bouncing around, it could be a 1990s green server. Several circles looks like those planetary compositions that people make on the sidewalk with spray paint cans. And Fern and Lovejay's contrast of forms. It looks more than a little dorm room. The two Chagall paintings are really good, especially Paris through the window, but on the other hand, this painting looks like something you have seen so many times before that it's almost better off on another mitt than in a museum. Then there are two exquisite Modigliani portraits. One a drippingly gorgeous nude, and the other a portrait of his doomed lover in a yellow sweater. 
but for every two of these there are four catastrophically ugly works, like Franz Marc's Yellow Cow, or any one of the Baroness's throwaway paintings. There are some okay Pegasos, mediocre Surats, and a good Rousseau painting called Dartel Riemann. But mostly it's a bunch of dated crap. Severini, Moholinagy, Gleizes, a whole host of painters whom most everyone has forgotten about. So, why not forget about the whole thing? The only way to justify this building would be for it to vanish. Then it would be beautiful. Beautiful and gone. Like the two towers, that became beautiful once they were gone. Against modernism and into unknown waters. A clean slate. Why not? We say demolish the Guggenheim. Why?